Fowderalla, Fowderalla, hink and you be round about. Right hands in and left hands out, hink and you be round about. The end of the 18th century was fast approaching, and it would be a matter of days before the year 1800 would make its appearance. Meanwhile, the Beard family's journey towards its destination seemed altogether interminable. Beard's coach was employed in its seemingly endless course through woodland and highland, the wheels complaining tirelessly of the poor conditions upon which they were forced to rotate. His wife, Jeanette, struggled to keep their six-year-old twin girls entertained, as her husband, having again complained to the coachman of the tedious progress their carriage allowed, shuffled his aching posterior on the unforgiving, ill-upholstered seating, and tried, and failed, to get comfortable, as he reflected on the purpose that gave rise to their journey. A publisher, geologist, evolutionary thinker, author, and journal editor, he had frequently travelled afar, but seldom had the journey been as disagreeable as this one. Yet it was one that needed to be endured, if he was to take possession of the property and fortune bequeathed to him by a heretofore unknown relative, and so continued to pursue his literary and scientific interests in some comfort. Hamish Beard was an only son, and the last male twig on the branch of the ancient family tree of Hinkham Booby. It was on this account that the legacy had befallen him and the timing could not have been more fortuitous. Evolutionary thinking, as his wife frequently complained, was all very well, but could scarcely be expected to furnish the necessities of life for their impoverished family. As night approached, their destination remained at some distance, due to the slowness with which the carriage proceeded over the rugged ground. The children were tired and irritable, his wife fast losing patience. So Hamish gave his orders to the hired groom, to stop at the approaching village, determining to pass the night there before completing their weary journey on the morrow. The coach and horses drew to a grateful stop at the door of a small, picturesque inn in the tiny village of Mope, quite at odds with the bleak and forbidding landscape that surrounded it. Clean, decent bedrooms were provided, and the coach driver was accommodated in the barn. A plain but hearty repast was served by the innkeeper's wife, after which... Jeanette took the children off to bed, and Beard retired to the bar at the innkeeper's invitation. There were no other patrons. A cheerful fire blazed in one corner. Holly and Ivy bedecked the walls, as appropriate to the Yuletide season. "'You'll be staying just the one night?' asked the innkeeper as he poured Hamish a glass of his finest single malt whisky. "'Just the one night, yes.' Hamish gestured towards the bottle. "'And do you have one yourself?' The innkeeper nodded his thanks and poured himself a goodly measure. We didn't get many visitors in their parts. I can't imagine why, Beard lied, in an attempt to be convivial. Can you not? The innkeeper smiled lugubriously. Tis a desolate state the new. And then again, he downed his drink in one quick gulp. Them that comes, ne'er they leave. <laughs> the innkeeper poured himself another shot whilst Hamish demurred. "'You'll be having business round here?' Uh, "'Way down the road,' Beard replied. "'At a village, name of Tittywitch. You know it?' The innkeeper blanched, and his eyes widened. "'Okay.' He downed his second drink, poured a third, and attempted to cover his unease. "'It's nae so far in fair weather, but in such weather as this.' The mention of the name seems to trouble you. What makes you respond in that manner? Ah, well, <laughs> Miss Folk wouldn't go there, sir. As you will, nay, if you take my advice. But I must go there. It is my destiny to go. I am the heir to Tittywitch Hall. Tittywitch Hall, is it? <laughs> he swallowed the third measure and poured a fourth. Rest of the fork are deed, are they? He shook his head. My ain mother was a mater in her younger days. She was ne a maid for long, he added darkly. She could have told ye some tales, I'm sure. Who'd curl the locks on your head, sir. And, um, where is your mother now? Langen. But she was fifty-three. 
"'Tis a ripe old age in thee parts.' "'But I have to go,' Hamish resumed his protestations, "'gesturing that he would welcome another drink. "'And truly he felt obligated to go, "'if only to take possession of the fortune that came with the property "'and settle his many debts. "'Residency had been a condition of the inheritance. "'Taking hold of his glass, he spake thus determinedly. "'I will go. I must.' "'Say be it, sir. "'Wait's for ye'll no go by ye.' the innkeeper replied grimly. But then he say, I did nae warn ye. Hamish woke to find their journey would be further compromised by a heavy blanket of snow that had fallen overnight and persisted still. Breakfasted and suitably dressed for the inclement weather, the beard party took their leave and were waved off mournfully by the innkeeper and his wife. The last stage of the journey should otherwise have taken less than half a day, but, in the event, took full the best part of it. Their destination emerged over the brow of a hill. The village, under its white mantle, took on the quaint traditional appearance of a Christmas card as it emerged from behind the curtain of snow. The streets were found to be empty, and an unearthly quiet was abroad. Light shone from windows, and on occasion the travellers spied a silhouette or two peeping out to watch their carriage pass through on its way to Titiwich Hall. The detailed directions obtained having proven to be wholly accurate, it was with a sensation approaching awe that the party found themselves parked and looking up at the imposing edifice. It was of that species of architecture which had endeavoured to unite status and fortune with domestic comfort. Situated in this thinly populated location, the family Hinkham Booby must surely have sought to rely on itself for entertainment and edification from the outset. They were met at the door by the housekeeper, Esther McVile, and the butler, Alistair Fling. She was a dour, sour-faced woman, whilst Fling, an old soldier, exhibited a blunt but hospitable manner and a pronounced limp. You lit! We expected you yesterday! Mrs. McVile ejaculated. I imagine you were delayed by the snow, interjected Fling helpfully. The snow, indeed, indeed, Beard answered, leading his little troop into the welcome refuge of the hallway. The solicitor sent word for old Ricky that has been similar inconvenience, master, but that he'll be here as soon as the weather allows. Hamish nodded. Uh, we'll take tea in the parlour, if you don't mind, Mrs. McVile. Fling? Would you please be so kind as to sort out our luggage and point the coachman in the direction of the stables? Fling nodded dutifully and set to his task. Mrs. McVile went to prepare tea, leaving them to find their own way to the parlour. It was eventually located behind the third door they tried. A pleasant room, sumptuously furnished, brightly lit by oil lamps and with a roaring log fire. Jeanette beamed her approval, and Hamish realised it had been a long time since he had seen such genuine pleasure on her comely face. Mrs. McVile reappeared with a tea tray. The children are rather tired after their arduous journey, Mrs. McVile, Jeanette said with an affectionate glance in their direction. Would you mind taking them up to their room and bringing them milk and sandwiches? I'll be up later to say good night. Mrs. McVile puffed up her chest. I done a deal with Burns, ma'am, she snapped. I'm the housekeeper near the maid. It's firkin you'll be wanting. Jeanette smiled fixedly. Then would you be so good as to call for Firkin? Mrs. McVile huffed, turned, and exited without another word. Once the door was closed, Jeanette and Hamish both laughed. I fear I have my work cut out for me there, Jeanette observed. If anyone can win her over, it is you, my dearest, Beard replied, and bent to kiss her hair. Don't, Jeanette bristled. You you'll mess up my curls. The snow lay deep the next morning, and dissuaded the family from entertaining any thought of exploring the grounds. Notwithstanding which, Jeanette took the children off to explore the inside of the house itself, whilst Hamish retired to the study to attend to business. The family solicitors, having warned him there were piles of papers and documents to be sifted through, he deemed it provident to make a start. It was in that oak panel chamber, thus occupied a half hour later, and with some surprise, that Hamish found Fling at the study door announcing the arrival of the Hinkambooby family solicitor, one Arthur Kipper. And a sodden, quivering wreck was ushered into the room, with snow dripping from his clothing. 
he dropped his briefcase to the floor with a thud. As Fling and Beard helped Kipper to a comfortable chair beside the fire, he informed them, through chattering teeth, that a calamity had befallen him en route. His pony and trap had lost their footing in the driving snowstorm, and having rolled into a deep ditch whilst throwing him free, had crushed the pony in the instant. He had then been forced to put the pony out of its misery with his trusty pistol, only to have to slog the last fifteen miles alone and on foot. It was horrible, horrible, he cried, covering his face and revealing his tender nature. Fling flung a rug around Kipper's shoulders, whilst Hamish handed him a brandy. We need to get you out of those wet clothes before you die of hypothermia. Gulping back the brandy, Kipper tried to stand, but his powerful thighs trembled and could not support him. He sank back onto the chair and swooned. Fling, would you please run Mr. Kipper a bath, bring a robe, and have a bed made ready, Beard instructed. As Fling left the room, Hamish set to the task of disrobing his visitor of every sodden stitch before admiring his handiwork. Kipper was, in naked repose, altogether a magnificent specimen of manhood, and one exhibiting the surfeit of health and vitality that would undoubtedly aid a swift recovery. The butler returned with slippers and a dressing gown, and, once attired, the young fellow was helped upstairs to the guest bathroom on the first floor. Beard rolled up his sleeves and first tested the temperature of the water with his elbow, before helping his visitor into the bathtub. As Kipper reclined, his stiffness visibly began to thaw. His circulation was further stimulated by a brisk rub-down with a soapy flannel, administered at Hamish's insistence and by his own hand, before leaving the young gentleman to soak. He found Fling on the landing, and was advised a bed was being made up in the room next to his own. Hamish requested that a maid also bring hot broth to the guest room, and further requested that Fling might inform his wife and children, when they reappeared, that they may have a guest to dinner. Fling looked flustered in turn. Your good wife, sir? Yes. In Bern, sir? Yes. Are you expecting their arrival, sir? What do you mean expecting? I brought them with me. But, Fling floundered, he arrived alone, sir. Beard could only wonder whether the old retainer was going senile. Come with me, he insisted, and marched to the nursery door. He flung it wide as if to say, Aha! but stopping at the first syllable. For he found the furniture within covered in dust sheets. He turned and strode to his wife's boudoir. Again, dust sheets. No blankets or pillows on the bed underneath, just a rolled up mattress. Nothing in the drawers or wardrobe. No trace at all of any inhabitant having been in situ. Was he going mad? He raced down to the scullery and burst in upon Mrs. McVile, who was feeding meat into a grinder. Where are my wife and children, Mrs. McVile? What has become of them? She wiped her bloody hands on her apron and stared at him blankly. He for what I can, sir. I never met them. Maybe you left them behind in town or on the side of the road. Her deed and a stink. But, he spluttered, but you saw them. You saw them with me when we arrived. You served us breakfast this morning. Aye! <laughs> you must have got me mixed or mixed or with someone else. But this is madness, he declared. Bring Firkin to me. Firkin, sir, replied Fling, dumbfounded. Yes. The pretty young housemaid who put the children to bed. Esther McVile sneered. We have been the one maid at the moment, and her name is Tuppence. You'll find her in the coop out back, strangling a chicken for tea, if you'd care to make her acquaintance, sir. But I doubt a body would describe Tuppence as bonny, or young, near mean the housemaid. A coachman, then. Bring him to me. Gone, sir, Fling replied. Took advantage of the break in the weather early this morning and wanted to get back to town. His good wife is with Baron, see? He might have told you this himself, if you'd ever trouble to engage him in polite intercourse, Mrs. McVile added, with a tight smile. I don't know what your game is, the pair of you, Bid snarled in response, but I fully intend to find my wife and children, and when I do... Leaving the threat hanging in the air, 
he raced out of the room and set off on a desperate search for his missing family. The search was an onerous task, for the house was nothing short of palatial. Still, needs must. And so he searched, and he searched, and he searched some more, from cellars to attics and back again, in every alcove, behind every door, under every bed and in every closet, yet to no avail. He found neither hide nor hair for all his diligence. And with the realisation came another. He had left Kipper in the bathtub hours before. How many hours he did not know, but it must have been some considerable number. In fresh alarm, he raced to the first floor bathroom, hoping upon hope that Kipper would not have drowned or frozen to death or, worse still, disappeared as mysteriously as Jeanette and the children had. For he was desperately in need of an ally. But the bathroom was empty and in immaculate order. Wearily, despondently, he made his way along the corridor to the bedroom adjacent to his own, it being his last hope. And, oh, the deep, deep joy of seeing Arthur Kipper recumbent in a nightshirt under the covers, an empty broth bowl, spoon and half crust of bread on the tray that stood on the nightstand with a carafe of water and glass alongside. Kipper was sleeping, albeit fitfully. A film of perspiration lay upon his flushed but rosy cheeks, and his fringe, a mass of damp golden curls, lay upon his forehead. Determined not to let the young man out of his sight, whilst feeling further obliged to nurse him back to full vigour, Hamish locked the bedroom door, and, stripping down to his undergarments, climbed in beside the ailing solicitor to show the warmth of his own body, and soon joined him in exhausted sleep. When Arthur's fever broke, he woke to find himself embraced in a fatherly fashion. Mr. Beard? Ah, Mr. Kipper! You are much improved, I see. It is good. Disentangling himself, Hamish swung his legs out of the bed, and, perching on the edge of the mattress, lit a candle at the bedside. He poured a glass of water from the craft before handing it to his charge. Kipper drank it lustily, and offered up the glass for a refill. Hamish duly replenished it. It must be the middle of the night, Beard observed. Doubtless you are hungry? Rather, Kipper replied. Do you think you are strong enough to accompany me to the scullery? I, I think so. Then follow me, Hamish said, getting to his feet and stepping into his trousers. But please, Mr. Kipper, do not venture from my sight, he added sternly. Not if you know what is good for you. The house was deathly quiet as Hamish led the way by candlelight along the darkened corridor and down the back stairs to the kitchen. A jug of ale, a chunk of cheddar, a loaf of crusty bread, homemade chutney, scotch eggs and a slab of seed cake were procured from the larder and lain upon the scullery table. Beard looked on as Arthur wolfed down their midnight feast, but ate little himself, finding he was without appetite. Once Kipper was replete, Hamish shared the shocking events of late. And the servants deny all knowledge of the existence of your wife and family? They do. In the candlelight, Arthur regarded Hamish queerly. What is it? Beard inquired. Oh, Kipper replied tentatively. It's just that... Um, well, I too stopped at the inn in the village of Mope along the way. It was the evening of the morning you had set off for Titiwich Hall. The innkeeper told me of your recent departure and it was for that reason I decided to press on into the night. Then I apologise, for it would appear I am the reason for your unfortunate calamity. Please don't reproach yourself, Arthur frowned. The odd thing is, and here he hesitated, it's just that the innkeeper, well, he made no mention of your wife or children, not a word. Beard clapped his hands to his head, and cried. Then I am mad. I must be mad. Calm yourself, sir, calm yourself, Kipper admonished him, jumping to his feet and placing a steadying hand on Beard's shoulder. That is not necessarily the case. It may simply be that the innkeeper did not think to mention them. We spoke but briefly. I told him I was your solicitor, and I was concerned for your welfare. My welfare? 
Well, your reclamation, then. And here Arthur ran a hand over his face. Do you know anything of the history of Titowich Hall? Do you know anything about your ancestors? Beard shook his head. Next to nothing beyond that to which the innkeeper inferred. Which was? That it should be avoided at all costs. Kipper gave a brief nod. I, I fear you know far more than you divulge. What is it, man? Hamish demanded. Out with it! Come. Let us retire to the study. Arthur replied. Hamish tossed a log onto the fire that burned low in the grate, and the two gentlemen sat on either side, each with brandy goblet in hand. Candlelight flickered over the scene. I am yet but a junior partner at Codling Kipper and Troughton, Arthur began as a start. My late father formed the partnership with Messrs Codling and Troughton, each senior partner specialising in a different area. Father specialised in moneyed reprobates and diligently and discreetly served the Hink and Booby family throughout the bulk of his career, before his retirement, that is. And I inherited his caseload from him. So there is history. I doubt that Messrs Codling and Troughton will appreciate me sharing certain information. Indeed, I was strongly advised against it. But I think it is only fair in the circumstances. Especially as you have shown me such great kindness. His long, luxuriant eyelashes fluttered. Tetty Witch Hall, he continued, was ill-conceived from the outset. It was the folly of the Earl of Dalry, one Kenneth Enias Hinkenbooby, who commissioned it, having conceived of it as a secret playground for the equally rich and equally debauched society with whom he kept questionable company in the city of Edinburgh but its remote location only served to diminish its appeal. The spacious rooms were scarce ever filled, and never very gay. The beau monde who normally flocked around those of the Earl's rank and ability in the city proved resistant, even to its licentious balls and the promise of giving themselves over to all manner of dark pleasures. Of course, the stiff manners of the great man and the tribe of lackeys who attended to his every whim compelled the greater part of society to avoid him like the plague at the best of times. But even his inner circle were disinclined to support him in his latest venture. It was shortly thereafter that the rumours began in earnest, rumours that were unproven yet evidently sufficient to strip the Earl of his title. It is said he and his wife had sought to sate their appetites from amongst the local village folk. The mistress recruiting its muscular youth to staff the bedchambers, the master collecting the flowers of the district as handmaidens. Tales of orgies, witchcraft, even cannibalism abounded. Then the local children began to disappear. The rumours only ended when the bones of the mistress were found, bleached and stripped of all flesh in a giant copper in the laundry. The master was never to be seen again. Hamish shuddered. You know how you came to inherit this hellish house, Kipper continued. Because all other relatives are dead. Cursed. With the aid of a genealogist, I managed to trace thirteen before you. All dead. 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 Beard stared at Arthur, ashen-faced. Dead? As doornails. Them that comes, ned de leaf. What? Something the innkeeper said to me. He took a careful sip of his brandy. But I somehow feel you had a particular reason for hastening to follow me here, despite the inclement weather. Am I wrong? No, not wrong. Arthur stood and recovered his briefcase from where he had dropped it. I was going through my late father's papers and found... Here he produced a map from within and handed it to Beard. This chart... It would appear there is a, a warren of secret passageways behind the walls, accessed by secret panels. I, I found it together with the architect's original designs and annotated by the Earl. There is one access here, in this very study. I thought you ought to know. Perhaps the answers lay there. Shh! Hamish bid him. Do you hear that? There came the sound of droning from somewhere outside. Half chant, half Baleful lament, and with it a flicker of orange light glinted through a crack in the curtains. 
Quick, lock the door, Beard directed as he crossed the curtain window. Having turned the key, Kipper joined him as he peeped through the crack, and both men gasped at the sight of a veritable phalanx of hooded figures holding flaming torches, immobile, but gathered in line at some small distance, stirring up at the house. We must find the secret passage. Where is it? Does the map give any indication? It makes no sense, replied Arthur. It says... Faldirala, Faldirala, hinkin' booby round about. Right hands in and left hands out, hinkin' booby round about. Faldirala, Faldirala. <laughs> but what could it mean? A frantic search of the room began, only to be interrupted by a hammering at the study door. Dear God, cried Kipper, and with Beard's help forcefully dragged an oak chest before it to further bar the way. At that moment, as Kipper retrieved his pistol from his briefcase, Hamish's eyes alighted on an articulated figure no more than three feet tall that had lain hidden in an alcove behind the dresser. It was of a knight armoured for battle. At the base, the nameplate read, Sir Falderell Hinkenbooby. Aha, he said going to the full extremity of the expression. He spun it on its stand, bent the right hand to its hip, and yanked the left hand out to the side, then swung the figure back to its starting position. And, wonder of wonders, a panel slid open beside the fireplace, as if by witchcraft. Good Lord, Kipper declared, as Hamish, having picked up a lighted candlestick from the mantelpiece, bundled him through the aperture and slid the panel shut behind them. The two gentlemen now found themselves in a cobweb passageway. In the distance they heard the drone of voices and the strains of the very same lament that they had heard before coming from outside the house. This drone was, however, emanating from within its very bowels. The ceiling was low and the way narrow. Both men had to crouch down and proceed in single file as they made their way by stealth along the gloomy corridor, Hamish taking the lead. The drone increased in volume with every step, and Beard trembled in anticipation at what they might find at Journey's End. He stifled a groan as he stubbed his toe unexpectedly, then stifled a shriek as, leaning down, he found the offending object was a discarded skull. Pressing forward, they found the pathway littered with the bones of the dead, and it was only with the careful placement of their feet that they managed to avoid tripping over them as they made their way inexorably forward. Turning a corner, they saw a vibrant orange glow at no great distance, and, blowing out the candle, they silently approached. Nothing could have prepared Hamish Beard for the sight that lay before his eyes as he peered around the corner. A cavernous room lit by at least thirty torches. Cowled figures blathered on with their dreary lament. To one side, Mrs. McVile, stripped to the waist, glistening with sweat and flexing her muscular arms, turned the handle on a spit. Engaged in roasting what Beard was forced to assume from the discarded livery pile beside the fire was the trussed and basted body of the hired coachman who had had the misfortune to deliver them to this accursed place. Atop a rocky platform stood a bearish figure, naked save for a codpiece which appeared to have been crafted from rabbit fur and was struggling to contain its hairy contents. He wore a half-mask and helmet with two giant antlers upon it. Hamish only recognised the figure when it spoke. Them that comes, near they leave. Hamish suppressed a gasp, astounded. Mother! Esther McVile stopped in mid-rotation. Tis time, the figure declared. There came an excited and expectant muttering from the hooded figures in attendance. She clapped her hands and out of the shadows limped Fling, similarly attired in a rabbit's fur pouch, and leading by means of a rope. The bound and blindfolded figures of Beard's wife and children towards the rocky plinth. The horned figure threw his arms wide, as if to embrace the assembly. In his right hand he held aloft a cleaver. No one will get hunger the next, he proclaimed triumphantly. Beard knew he had to do something, and do it quickly. But what? It was then he felt the barrel of the pistol press into the base of his skull, and heard Kipper's solicitous whisper. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Bert. But I promised Father I'd prove myself worthy of the business. And the gun went bang. Fowderalla, Fowderalla, hink and do be round about. Right hands in and left hands out, hink and do be round about. 